Um, I th yeah, I think we're still trying to get the display. So, um, so what? Let me explain. So, a couple of th let's uh, let's do a little cu couple of housekeeping type things. Um, how many of you saw the on the uh, web page for the talk? There were instructions for uh, setting up your laptop for this uh, workshop. How many of you were able to do that? It didn't work. Okay. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> Um, was, it, the, the link was, was, was the link broken? Yeah. Yeah. So that's my mistake. Sorry. Apparently I didn't check that. Uh, I wrote a book that has all this content in it, so if you just want to leave now and buy the book instead, <laughs> <laughs> that works too. <laughs> all right, so hopefully a lot of what we'll do here is I, I, a lot of it is conceptual in the components of how OpenStack fits together. So not being able to have directly hands on it, I think you'll still be able to get a lot out of this. And then hopefully um, we can figure out how to correct the link. And um, I'll, I'll also show you a, a link you can go to that has the information on it. Really, all the link in the description was just pointing to the RDO project website. And there's two different installation methods. So um, we can talk about those and then hopefully a lot of the information here you guys can try on your own later and looks like there's a video camera in the back so hopefully you could watch back through it again and walk through it and we'll hand out our cards to everyone so if you have questions you can get personal support <laughs> I, I mean you can have Ken's card <laughs> So this, so, so I apologize. So this could end up being a little bit more of a show and tell, um, but nevertheless, uh, hopefully, if you're new. So I think the way we'll try to do this is once we have whatever the audiovisual issues uh, worked out, is uh, I'm actually going to start us off uh, by giving you kind of a brief overview conceptually of what OpenStack is and what is intended to be, uh, and then what Dan's going to do is. Uh, walk through actually the various components that make up OpenStack and show you what it looks like, talk a bit about what its intention is. Um, and, and since I think given that there aren't going to be as much uh, hands-on, I think the way, to, the way we want to make this work is if you have questions um, as we're walking through these projects, um, it, whether it be uh, architectural questions or implementation questions, you should go ahead and just ask them so we can kind of address them um, and make sure that everyone in the room understands what we mean when we talk about Nova or what we mean when we talk about neutron provider networks, for example. Hmm. So. Okay. We should answer the beginning. We start. Just fix, I always fix everything. We did that once already. shutting down now. <laughs> okay. While we're waiting, uh, um, probably good, probably a good idea just to do some quick intros um, so you know who's up here uh, trying to get this to work. Uh, so my name is Ken Hoy. I am. Uh, I do technical marketing for a startup in the OpenStack ecosystem called Platform Nine, uh, that just came out of stuff last year. So a lot unexpected. Many of you have heard of us, um, but uh, prior to that, I worked at EMC, uh, doing OpenStack strategy for EMC, and uh, before that, I was at Rackspace as the uh, OpenStack evangelist. So and and also as a, a cloud architect. So I've done both kind of. Talking to people about OpenStack, I've also done some OpenStack um, production design and implementation. So, let's see if this works. Dan, you want to 
do a quick intro? Oh, yeah. So uh, my name is Dan Radies, and I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat on the OpenStack engineering team. Um, currently working in the OPNFE community to help take OpenStack into uh, the NFE world and, and have an open platform for uh, telcos and um, those that want to run an NFE-like workload uh, using OpenStack. So kind of taking it out of its generic cloud capabilities into a very specific use case. Um, and previous to that, I ran a website called tristack.org for about three or so years, which is a free place that you can go and use OpenStack. It's already installed, it's already running. Uh, you can, right now it uses Facebook authentication and we're working to move over to OpenStackID.org authentication. Um, it's a free place to go and, and spin up instances and work with uh, OpenStack. They need an account, right, to use TriStack to set up an account? If you have a Facebook account right now, then uh, you can log in through that, and then once we move over to the OpenStack ID stuff, they'll, if you have an OpenStack ac foundation account, you'll be able to use that to log in. How, how long does it take for them to get an account? Oh, to actually be able to use TriStack from the time they register? There's an approval process that we go in and just make sure that you're not a robot creating a bunch of Facebook accounts, uh, and usually it takes 24 hours or so for someone. It's unfortunately a manual process where me and my teammates have to go in and click OK on people. Um, so it's, it's about, you know, once you register about a day or so later, you should be able to get in. Can, uh, you guys can see that now? OK, I'm going to. Yeah. Let me get OpenStack installing so we can get started. <coughs> Sorry, I had all this set up before the um, issues, and then when we reboot it, it resets. It, um, the demo isn't so happy about that, unfortunately. Read the um, first half presentation. Do you want to um, show them the link to the LDL community in case they want to try? If you'd, if you'd like to try and follow the quick start for RDO, um, it's rdoproject.org, and at the top there's a quick start link. And so if you have like a VM or something running and you want to give that a whirl, I don't know how well the uh, wireless will hold out, but um, you're welcome to give it a try if you'd like. So, well, you guys, if some of you want to try it out, you can see that you may be able to, if the Wi-Fi holds up, you may be able to actually, um, while I'm starting, while I'm kind of walking through an overview of OpenStack, you may be able to get an audio instance running on your laptop uh, so that when um, Dan starts walking through, uh, kind of the hands-on piece, you'll be able to follow along. If not, again, it'll end up being more of a show and tell. I uh, apologize for that, but then you should still be able to look back over the video later um, and hopefully we'll still be able to explain enough of the concepts and the implementation details so you guys get a good understanding of what OpenStack does um, in a production environment. So, uh, so I'm going to roll forward. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I think we already did this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Story of OpenStack. There you all go. All right. So a little bit about, um, do, you, do you all know the, the, uh, which two companies started OpenStack? Any idea? NASA, NASA, right? So, so um, it's 
I'm, I put this up because it's, it's kind of an important, um, it's important for setting some context about what OpenStack is, because I think OpenStack has morphed in some cases, and in some cases it's been confusing about what exactly is OpenStack trying to do. But essentially, uh, this is an email that was sent by an executive from Rackspace. At the time, Rackspace had a public cloud that they were using to try to challenge a, uh, AWS. Uh, this is before AWS is the, is the behemoth that it is today. Um, and they had reached a, po a point where they were having problems scaling that public cloud out. So they decided they would start from scratch and build something new using Python. And at the time they were doing that, it turned out, so they were building OpenStack for, to create a public cloud, an AWS type public cloud for cloud native applications. At the same time, a, a group within NASA in the US uh, decided to build a private cloud app um, that, because they weren't, allow, they weren't allowed to use AWS. And they also decided to build it using Python. Um, and so Rackspace found out about it, contacted the, one of the CTLs of NASA, and uh, basically this email started a discussion where they agreed that they would create this new uh, open source cloud platform and then essentially uh, give it to the community. And so that's how OpenStack started. So, um, no. I'll just come over so I can do it. Okay. So, so essentially, uh, the, the history of OpenStack is it was really an effort by uh, Rackspace, who's doing public cloud, NASA, who's interested in private cloud, to build an open source alternative to AWS. Um, which it's, it's really important when you start talking about later, when you, we talk about some of the things that uh, OpenStack can't and can't do, right? Because sometimes OpenStack gets faulted for saying, why can't you do something that I can do in VMware, right? And it's fairly important to understand that, that the context is uh, OpenStack initially was never created to be a challenger to uh, VMware. It was created to be an alternative to Amazon Web Services. And so it made certain design decisions about uh, what it should support and how it should be architected to do that. And now, from that, those two companies, and maybe a few thousand lines of code, now obviously many of you know, OpenStack is uh, one of the largest uh, open source projects in the world. Um, I think at one time it was the fastest growing project. I'm not sure Docker might have surpassed OpenStack in that, uh, for that title. Um, and it's uh, a, a continually growing project. More and more companies and individuals are being involved. Um, so let's talk a bit about what OpenStack is, because I, especially since many of you are still new to, what, to OpenStack today. Okay. So one of the, initially when OpenStack was first released, um, there was some confusion about what it, uh, it, in that a lot of people thought it was a hypervisor, uh, essentially a way to run virtual machines uh, in a private or public cloud. And that's act actually not what OpenStack is. So OpenStack at, um, at heart is really an orchestration platform, right, that sits on top of a number of virtual technology, uh, resources and technologies. So it actually, doesn't it is actually doesn't have a hypervisor. It actually lets you manage uh, any number of hypervisors. So what I mean by that is you can use uh, OpenStack today to manage KVM, but you could also use it to manage Hyper-V, or you can use it to manage uh, vSphere. So it, it's as long as a hypervisor has a driver for OpenStack Nova, which is the compute project, it, OpenStack can manage that. Now, most implementations today are running, uh, uh, supporting KVM, and Rackspace, which has the largest OpenStack implementation in the world, it's uh, running, uh, uh, Zen is the hypervisor that has been used for some legacy reasons. But in either case, so it's fairly important that what it's doing is, is basically orchestrating and managing a pool of compute or pools of networking, uh, networks or pools of storage. So it takes all of that and basically uh, gives, and what's very important, end users the ability to do self-service, on-demand self-service provisioning of those resources. So if you think about what, what's going on before OpenStack and before a AWS, which is what OpenStack is trying to emulate, right? If you had to, if you're a developer, actually let me ask, how many of you here are uh, developers or do development? Yeah, okay, and how many of you are operators? So if you've been in this industry long enough, you probably remember a time where if you needed 
If you're a developer and you need a VM, you need to send an email to an operator, and then you have to wait for the operator to get a machine up and running for you. And what AWS enabled you to do was to say, the operators just have to set up the pop they don't have to be involved anymore. Uh, with the provisioning standpoint, developers can do it themselves. And that's what OpenStack's trying to do. It's basically saying, let me take the resources you have in your data center and present it in such a way that developers can actually access it and be able to provision their own resources using either the dashboard or, or a set of open APIs. So that's, a, again, a very important differentiation between what OpenStack can do and what a typical virtualization platform can do. Right. And it does it in a, in a loosely coupled architecture. So you guys see this eye chart here, right? One of the complaints that sometimes people have is that it looks like OpenStack is spaghetti. <laughs> of various components. Uh, but, in, but rather than it being a weakness, it's actually a strength, right? Because, uh, if, again, if you think about what OpenStack's trying to be, it's trying to be a, a platform for cloud-native applications, which means it needs to be scalable. And you, and you can't scale a cloud platform. The cloud platform is monolithic. It, too, has to be distributed in cloud-native-like. So uh, what OpenStack's trying to do is actually, when it built the architecture, it try to have this concept of loosely coupled components um, so that you can scale the compute independently of the network and you can scale the storage independent of the compute. And really the goal of what OpenStack's trying to do with your data center resources, it wants you to provide, it wants to provide self-service, it wants to be able to do it in a very fast way, and it wants to do it at large scale, right? And you, and you can think, if you think about why that's valuable, it's the same reason that people find AWS in many ways valuable, which is, again, in the old days, if you had to, if you couldn't do self-service, and you had to get a minute, an, an operator to spin up a VM for you, it probably meant that you could maybe do 10 projects a year at a given cost, right? And maybe three of them are successful, and the other seven fail. Well, now, if you, when you, if you can do self-service rapidly and at scale, now instead of 10 projects, maybe you can do 30 projects for the cost of 10. And now you can, you, uh, if you get six projects that are successful, your, your, your rate of success, success is lower, but you've actually created more gen business generate, uh, revenue generating uh, applications. So that's kind of the reason why uh, OpenStack was built, was to give developers and businesses the ability to do projects very quickly and be able to um, if you guys have heard the term fail fast, right? The idea is start something new. Uh, if it doesn't work, just kill it and start over again. Again, that was something that was really hard to do if you had to do it through the traditional uh, data set, uh, op, uh, IT way. With this new way of doing it, since developers can do spin up resources themselves, right, um, they can do it more rapidly. So. And... Um, Today, there's actually three, uh, three different ways. If you're, a if you're a consumer of OpenStack, there's three ways to actually do that. Um, one is obviously the public cloud, which is what Rackspace was interested in. Um, and then there is kind of the private cloud uh, distribution model, which is what NASA was interested in. And then a third way has, a, has emerged called a private cloud as a service or managed private cloud. So, uh, so think about public clouds being multi-tenant, uh, running somewhere else, not in your own data center. Whereas a private cloud is something you installed in your own data center, you operate it yourself, right, and using your own data center resources. Private cloud as a service is actually a middle ground, right, where it's um, a single tenant, it, uh, uh, it can actually be running your own data center, but you don't actually operate OpenStack. Someone else operates it for you. So it's kind of a hybrid model between public and private. And uh, this is from the OpenStack Marketplace. So this is the uh, various companies that are offering uh, these different consumption models. Uh, so it's really important for you, um, if you are a, a consumer of OpenStack, if you're a decision maker of OpenStack, to say what model works, what model actually is most important for me uh, as an end user, right? It's do I, uh, is it better for me if I, just, if I just don't have any capital at all, expenditure and all, and I do everything off-prem on a public cloud, right? Um, 
but or you may be someone who wants to do a private cloud, but you don't have the engineering resources to do it yourself. In which case, you can actually pay someone to essentially operate OpenStack on your behalf, but you can still have um, kind of the security of having everything running in your own data center. All right, before I go into kind of this last section, uh, before I hand over to Dan, uh, any questions so far about what OpenStack is, what it's intended to be? Okay. No? Uh, one thing I, I do want to say is there is a, I, I don't know how many, if any of you were at, my pa at the panel I was on yesterday, there is an uh, open debate going on right now in the OpenStack community about uh, what should OpenStack be designed for. And what I mean by that is, as I said in the beginning, OpenStack was designed to be an alternative to AWS, which means that it's really designed to do cloud native type applications. That doesn't need, and if, that assumes you have commodity hardware, that assumes the infrastructure fails, and that your applications are gonna handle all the failures. And now there's a de definitive uh, uh, segment of the OpenStack community that says, well, that's not what we really want OpenStack to be. What we want OpenStack to be is a open source version of, v of VMware. And we want to have it be able to do you know, automatic failover, we want it to be able to, have an in uh, be able to uh, run legacy applications like Oracle and Exchange versus uh, native cloud native applications and like MongoDB and those other NoSQL databases. Um, so you, sometimes when you talk to people in the community, sometimes you hear one, uh, when they talk about OpenStack, they, they're talking about as a cloud native platform, and then you talk to other people and they talk about OpenStack as a, again, an a open source version of VMware. And at this point, it's not clear to me yet uh, which one it will become, or whether they will try to be both at the same time. And I have all kinds of opinions about what we should actually do. Uh, that I won't share today, but uh, I did share at the panel. So, uh, but that's something, again, as, a, as if you're deciding whether you want to use OpenStack, that's something to be uh, kind of keep track of, right, to see uh, where OpenStack is today, but where is it likely to be in the future. Okay, talk about if you're new to OpenStack. So some, so some ways to learn about OpenStack. Um, obviously, you can go to OpenStack uh, Foundation website, and there's all kinds of documentation and learning resources. Um, as well, there's uh, just a couple of books that talks about, uh, that walks you through how to use OpenStack. Uh, there's the a cookbook that some couple of Rackspace guys did, and then there's the OpenStack Central book that I think Dan did, mm -hmm. which again walks through how to set up an OpenStack uh, test environment. And a lot of the material in the OpenStack Essentials book is, is written directly from this presentation, so they map each other very closely. There's some differences as OpenStack's evolved release from release, but the, the core concepts that are presented here are also presented in that book, um, walking through setting things up and knowing what the components are and how they interact with one another. Okay. Thanks. I'm trying to think of the one before Kilo, whatever that, Juno? I, Juno, right? Yeah, Juno, yeah. I do the same thing. It's like, how do you do the alphabet backwards, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I believe it's written on Juno. So obviously in, in two releases, there's uh, things that have evolved. For instance, the Converge CLI is not in there where um, each of the components had their own CLI and now there's the Converge, so that's not in there. It's based largely on Packstack, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, and there's um, other installation methods that are available now too. So there's there's a few updates that could be done and I'm in discussions with the publisher of whether or not to do a revised edition to update these things. Um, but the, the core concepts that are in there are very much the same and same thing presented that I'll get into. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and then a kind of a, another way to learn OpenStack is um, there is a number of user groups that exist. Uh, and these user group typically run uh, once a month, or once every few months, depending on the user group. And they're basically a way where they bring users and vendors who can talk about uh, various technologies um, related to OpenStack. So uh, open, the OpenStack.org website has a community page. I encourage you to go to that page and find out if there's an OpenStack user group in your area that you can attend. If there isn't one, 
but there's a, you think there's a good core group of people who would want to be, have one, uh, you can certainly reach out to the foundation and, the, and there are people uh, like myself, um, but others all over the world whose uh, specific job uh, is to help new user groups get started. So I encourage you to do that. And I think I want to hand it over to Dan. So uh, Dan, you're going to, this is based on the Liberty. Oh, yeah, release. so the okay. current release that was that just went GA is Liberty. So what I've got installed here, what I'm going to show you is Liberty. So where the book is two releases old, the pictures that are in there, this is the current stuff fresh out of the gate. Um, I guess, yeah. So, and I talked about it before, The what we're going to install here is RDO. RDO is Red Hat's community distribution of OpenStack. And what that means is that Red Hat takes all the upstream bits from the OpenStack Foundation on release, brings it down, and puts it into RPMs, and then distributes it. So there's no, nothing specific to Red Hat about RDO at all. It's, it's upstream vanilla OpenStack that gets distributed, and all we're doing is packaging it in RPMs, which is what we know and what we're good at. So we take that expertise of packaging it and distribute it so that you can get upstream OpenStack through RPM installation instead of through source code. Um, right, and it runs on Red Hat Linux or CentOS, right? Either one. Anything RPM based, yep. yeah. Um, and so, you know. Sorry to interrupt. I would like to ask what is the difference between the Red Hat and your RDO perspective if you can shed some light on it? One is supported and one's not, is the primary difference between them. The pace that OpenStack moves is quick enough that Red Hat doesn't carry many patches that we distribute to our customers before a new release comes out. Um, so the, the delta between the RDO project and RHEL OSP, the, the Red Hat Enterprise OpenStack platform is, man, that's a mouthful, <laughs> is um, it, there's very little between the two of them. There's some Red Hat branding and there's support on OSP. Um, but if you install RDO, you're getting almost an identical experience. Right, um, it, it's not that there's no support, though. It's community supported. Right, you're right. Yeah, RDO is community supported. So right. RDO has a very vibrant community around it. On IRC, there's mailing lists. There's the website full of wikis. Um, so there's, there's a lot of community right. support. So Thank you. you do, it's kind of like Red Hat Linux versus CentOS, right? You do Red Hat's OpenStack, you have one throat to choke. If you mm -hmm. go RDO, you have too many throats to choke. <laughs> is there like a fedora, is there a fedora uh, equivalent where it's all, you know everything's up to uh, Our, RDO to is the fedora of OpenStack for Red Hat. So if yeah. you're familiar with Red Hat's model, every product that we have, we also have a community project that we sponsor and help to cultivate. So Red Hat Enterprise Linux, the community project for that is Fedora. So we take snapshots of the Fedora project, and that's what becomes Rel, and that's what we distribute. Um, CentOS is a little bit of a, a different um, case uh, because it existed outside of the Red Hat ecosystem before Red Hat began to help fund and keep it alive. Um, and what CentOS is, it takes all of this, the source code from RHEL and then rebrands it as CentOS. So there's a, another way that if you want to run something as close to RHEL as possible and give it a try, then you know, run on CentOS, and that's, there's very little between CentOS and RHEL as far as the, the bits that come. It's the difference of community-supported versus enterprise-supported. And is RDO close to, tr how close is RDO to trunk? So RDO is stable. Stable, okay. So if, if you're installing RDO, you're going to be installing the, the Liberty GA bits, and then when SR1 comes out, then you'll get the, the security yeah. release updates. Um, but we do have packages that are built, it's called DeLorean, and that is actually master. So within the RDO project, you can both get the stable release or the master release uh, in RPM. Okay. And so, so these are new terms. So what that means, if you get that master release, you're getting bleeding edge code. Could be literally someone just put something new patch in like an hour ago. <laughs> and, um, to this, uh, right now, I don't know, I don't know any company that's using trunk or the master. Mm -hmm. um, Rackspace comes close. They, they're public cloud. They are um, two weeks behind master at any one time. So, but most people are several months behind. Yeah. Um, okay, so this was a plug for Red Hat because I work for them and they pay my salary. So um, 
my family really appreciates that, and that's why this slide is here. <laughs> uh, now, I talked earlier about PackStack uh, is kind of referred to as a, a test case or a proof of concept type installer. There's a way that you can go in and do a PackStack all-in-one install, and it'll take a single machine, it'll stand it up, you can do it inside of a VM, and then you have OpenStack running all inside a VM. Um, and so what I've used to install here is RDO Manager, and this is uh, an installer in the RDO community that is based on the Triple O project, that instead of using um, kind of a traditional install the operating system and then install OpenStack on top of it, it does an image-based deployment, so it will pre-build the images that are launched, uh, or that are run on the OpenStack cloud that's being run and then pushes them out. And what this does is it mirrors the way that OpenStack works. So as we move through here, that will hopefully make more sense. Um, but ask me later if we need to connect some dots there, and uh, I can expand more on RDO Manager. But RDO Manager is the um, community project for the supported Red Hat installer in our OSP release. The Architecture of what I've installed and what we're going to use is based off of three nodes. So there's an instack installer node, and there's a control node, and there's a compute node. So instack is just that. It's the installation method that, or it's a node that handles the installation for us. The control node is where all of your APIs are going to live and what you're going to connect to to interact with OpenStack. And the compute node is the hypervisor. It's where the VMs that will be spawned will actually live and actually be running. The component tree of OpenStack looks, uh, let's walk through the components that we're going to look at, I guess, is, is where I'm trying to go here. Um, authentication is handled by a keystone or identity. This is where users and tenants and roles within OpenStack exist. We'll get into all of these components in more detail one by one as we walk through OpenStack. I'm going to run kind of quick through them here. Uh, then we're going to hit Cinder, which does uh, block storage, block volume management. We'll go to Neutron, which is the OpenStack networking component, and it handles the virtual networking within the OpenStack cloud. We'll hit Nova, which is compute or hypervisor management and scheduling. After that, we'll look at um, Cinder. I think I misspoke the one earlier. This one back here was Glance, which is image management. That's the images that the instances run off of. Uh, then Cinder is block storage, volume management. And then Swift is object storage. So these are two different types of storage that OpenStack can use. And then the way that we're going to look through all of it is in Horizon. And Horizon is the, the dashboard um, that is it's the web UI to OpenStack. So we're going to interact with all of this so it's more eye candy and you're not just looking at gobs of text floating by on a screen, which is um, how some people like to work in the dark, I suppose. But in a, a setting like this, it's more fun to see the web UI. Ha, 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 that was funny. Come on, guys. There we go. So let's start with the dashboard. Um, it's a web-based interface for managing OpenStack resources. The team that builds the dashboard has a commitment that any core project, at, well, I guess core is no longer a, a thing now. Um, I don't know what their commitment is anymore. It used to be that there was this thing called core, and a project would be accepted as part of the core set of OpenStack. And so the dashboard would work to make sure that there was support in the web UI for all of these core components. With the new governance model that OpenStack has, big tent model, um, this idea of core has gone away. And I haven't actually learned how what, what the new way that the dashboard is um, committing to having parts in there. Uh, it's a modular plugin design, so it's, it's intended to make it easy that when new projects do need web interface support that they can drop in a module and it'll magically appear within the framework. They've just rewritten it from Django to Angular, um, so there's kind of a, a big change that's happened under the covers to the dashboard in Liberty this release. Um, and I've already discussed that last point is moot at this point. So let's see if we can log into this. I had my web browser up earlier, and I'm going to stop making excuses about that now, I hope. <laughs> you guys see that? Yep. Okay. 
Yeah, this is Horizon, the dashboard. So this is our initial login here. And when Instack, um, when Instack, the installer, does the install, it puts a couple files on that Instack machine that has the password for the admin user. So what I'm pasting here is a pre-generated admin password. And so now I'm logged into OpenStack as the admin user, and you can see there's information about usage, there's an interface. Um, so let's move forward with what we can actually do with this. So we'll start with identity management in Keystone. So this is where our users are going to live, how we're going to delegate roles to projects within OpenStack. Uh, Keystone is, an, is a centralized identity service that across your cloud, you're going to check into Keystone for identity management. There's, you can do multiple forms of authentication, so you don't just have to do like the username, password, in the database for Keystone. You can plug in. Um, OAuth or uh, AD, I think there's Kerberos support at this point. There's, they're forever adding more authentication support. So whatever kind of authentication you want to plug into Keystone, if it's not there now, it's probably in the works, uh, you know, the, the most popular ones. It's also a centralized catalog of services. What this means is that all of these components that we're going to look at all have to be registered with Keystone so that they can communicate with one another. So each of the components actually authentic authenticating get tokens from Keystone to be able to talk to one another. So when you put in a request to OpenStack to do whatever it is that you're going to do, um, the component that you're talking to probably will have to interact with other components. And to do that, they have to know about each other and be authenticated with each other. So Keystone is kind of the, the glue to put all that together. So let's use Keystone to add a user. I'm actually going to start by changing the password for my admin user, because we'll have to log back in later. So here's my admin user. I'm going to yes. jump in and change the password here to OpenStack, so you guys can all hack my cloud. Ha ha ha, come on, that was funny. So uh, it's just, just to um, clear some th make some things clear too. So remember I said that um, um, the origins of OpenStack was Rackspace wanting to create a public cloud. So if you think about what does a public cloud need. It needs, uh, it needs an admin user who's a super user for the entire cloud but the assumption is you're going to have multi-tenants, which means uh, you need to have, be able to group resources in such a way that only certain users can access those resources um, and not be imp impact other users who are using the same cloud. So that's what. So right now, Dan's logged in was uh, is logged in as a was is logged in as a super user. Mm -hmm. He's going to create a a, a kind of a subordinate user who has rights to. Um, certain cloud resources, and typically you're going to group them by a tenant. Um, in the case of OpenStack, though, for some reason we don't call them tenants anymore, we call them projects. So when you say a project, think tenant. Just think of a, a group of... Uh, They're the same groups. word, essentially. A yeah. tenant and a project is just a grouping of resources in yeah. OpenStack. Tenant would have been a better word. I don't want to use one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've logged back in as the admin user now with a password that I can actually remember and not have to copy from somewhere. I went back to my identity panel, which was over here on the, the left-hand side, and clicked my Create User button, which was right here in the top right. I filled in a username. I've put my email in there so you all can tell me how much you love me later. I've put in a password that's the same so you can hack both users. And then here's the project idea here. So this user has to be a member of a project to create user resources. So generally speaking, if there's one user in that project, you create the project with the same name as the user. If there's multiple users, you can create a project name that's relative to those users. So I've added the name for the project there. You can see OpenStack populated the project name, create user. Now we have a new user. I can log out as the admin and log back in as the user that I just created. So the thing that you'll notice is over on the left-hand side of the screen now, the admin panel has gone away, and now there's a bunch of panels for managing all the different kinds of resources from OpenStack. So let's move forward into more of those so that we can keep looking at them. So when an instance launches, it needs 
a disk. It needs something to run off of, an, a, an OS. And so the way OpenStack does this is with images. So Glance is our image management system. And it's just a registry of disk images for VMs. So what you do is pre-bake these, these images and then stick them into Glance so that when you launch a VM, you can then pull out one of these, Im these, instant these images and launch the VM directly off of something that's pre-baked. They're all over the internet, so if you search for OpenStack image of your particular flavor of what you want to launch, um, they're all over the internet. I've downloaded one which is a, a testing type instance, but um, most of the popular distros have them. The backing store is also configurable, so out of the box it's just going to put it on the local disk, but if you want to put it on shared storage or some other place, if you have a lot of images or some big ones, you can, um, you can configure that. So as my non-privileged user, my non-admin user, uh, I'm in this compute section here, and this, but, uh, this link here is instances, so I'm going to click on instances, and I'm going to say create image. Create image is more, I'm creating a record of an image in OpenStack. I'm not actually building the image at this point. Ceros is the name of the image, and it's just, like I said, a testing image. It's not really intended to be used for production. It's, it's very small and very lightweight and very insecure. So it's good for demonstrations like this or to test a cloud that you're trying to build, um, but it's, it's not good for much else. And I've got a copy of it on my um, laptop here. And I'm just going to upload this into this cloud. The format is a QCOW image. So I've, I've selected, I've given it a name, I've selected the file that I'm uploading, and I'm selecting the format of it. Uh, and if you download one off the internet, it, it should give you that format image. So it's going to upload this image, and it'll be registered in OpenStack so that we can then launch an instance off of it. The next thing that you need to launch an instance after a image is a network to put it on. So the next thing that we're going to look at is Neutron, which is OpenStack networking. It's networking as a service, so it's going to build these virtual networks. And the idea is that you can isolate a network from project to project. So my user will have its own network space, and another user would have, or another project would have its own network space. And then how you route traffic in and out of that is what Neutron allows you to do and allows you to configure. Again, it's modular so that if you don't want to use Open vSwitch, which is under the covers by default, you can plug in Vendor X into Neutron and use their uh, integration with Neutron. Uh, and then I just talked about the tenant isolation there. So adding a network for this instance now. Is this big enough? Can you guys see this? The screen kind of got squashed. Um, so networks and create network network name. I'm going to call this internal and that will become clear in a minute and I'm just going to give it a 172 address showing that it's um, a private network here. And then within the network that we're creating we want a DHCP agent so at the top of the screen it shows enable DHCP and then a name server because DHCP is supplying the IP address, you also give it a name server so that DHCP can tell it where to re resolve its DNS once it comes up. So now I have a network called internal. Yay! You guys say that with me. Yay! Oh, you guys, come on. Yeah, there we go. Much better. Thank you. All right, we've got a network. So now we have an, an image in there that we can launch. We've got a network that we could launch the instance on. So we've come to launching an instance, which is handled by Nova, our, our hypervisor management. Uh, so it's going to manage compute resources. You can have lots of compute nodes, and Nova's going to know about those nodes. They all check into Nova, and then you can launch your instances, and, and they'll be scheduled across there. So it's providing virtual machines on demand, um, kind of like Kim was talking about earlier, how Amazon changed that game, that if you needed uh, if you need compute resources, it used to be you send in an email and wait a couple of months while they order the server and rack it and whatever they got to do. Now you push a button, instance on demand, right? It gets spun up in the cloud. And it's designed for horizontal scaling. So if you need more compute power, you put more commodity servers into the rack alongside the ones you have and tell them where Nova is to check into it. And you have more compute resources by using just simple off-the-shelf basic servers. So let's boot an instance. I'm going to go back into the compute panel and select instances. 
launch instance, and it's going to give us this dialog that has a ton of information. So first of all, we need to give it a name. I'm going to call it first instance. The flavor, you can see over on the right-hand side how the flavor will change um, in that flavor details, and all that's doing is showing how many vCPUs, how much memory, how much disk is being allocated to a particular instance when it gets launched. You can do more than one if you want in this instance count, and then the boot source is, uh, there's, there's a few we're going to use boot from image, which is going to pull an image from glance. So when I select boot from image, my Cirrus image is sitting there, and I can now specify the image that I imported, boot off of that Cirrus image, so that when the instance comes up, it comes off of the image that I imported and expect to have it running off of. Next, we'll move to access and security. The kind of the paradigm in cloud computing to get into an instance of a virtual machine like this is to use SSH keys. So uh, right now, I have no key pairs available. Um, I could go and generate one. Um, but I'm just going to add my own off of my machine so I can get into it later. Um, not, uh, not right now. So if you missed the, we, we have put the instructions for how, how to install this on your laptop, but uh, we didn't realize the link was broken. Um, so, but um, we'll probably go back and fix the link. Yeah, and I'll probably put them on SlideShare too. So if you yeah. search my name on SlideShare, I'll, I'll get them up there. Maybe we'll put them on Ken's too so that search either of us. And sure. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, and then you, need, you also need a security group. Security groups are, are built in like virtual firewalls for your compute. So um, I'm just going to leave it on default. You can name multiple and have different security groups if you want. We're just going to operate out of default for simplicity's sake at this point. And then if we look at the networking tab, you'll see that the internal network that I created is already selected because there's only one. If I had multiple networks in my tenant, I would have to go and specifically choose a network. But since there's just one, it automatically selects it for me. So if I launch this now, the instance will, um, what's happening here is that Nova is going out and communicating to the hypervisor. And it's spawning a VM. And then it's going back to Glance, and it's getting that image from Glance that we uploaded. It's pulling it over to the hypervisor. It's putting it in place so that the instance can launch. And it's then creating the, the virtual ports in Neutron so that all the networking gets created. And it's launching the instance. So the instance will come up and will be running. And hopefully OpenStack won't make a liar out of me, right? And, and um, just so I, I, as you can see, this is actually fairly simple, right? Um, so a couple of things to keep in mind. One is this is supposed to be interface at a user, not the operator, right? So these are really a developer can use this interface. Um, we've actually, it was actually a little more complicated <laughs> because uh, Dan was trying to show you how to create the networks and create the images. But actually, in a, in a real production environment, ideally, the operator, the super user admin, have, would have, uh, could, might have created all the images already, mm -hmm. might have probably created all the networks, and then as an end user, you're not creating those things. You're basically just saying, I want an instance. I'm going to choose you know, this size, or this network, using this image, and then let it go. Um, so it's actually even simpler than what Dan was demonstrating. Yeah, and if you go to tristack.org, you get a real end user experience, because a lot of the things that the operator or the administrator would have already done is already done there. So if you log in and launch instances there, you'll get the experience of uh, some of the things that we're going to get to already be crea being created, some of the Im images already being launched in there. So this is kind of going over what each of the components is. But uh, right. So you're right. basically showing what an operator would do, mm -hmm. as well as what the end user would do. So. Now, we created a network that is an internal network. And to be able to get into this instance, we need to create external access to it because that internal network is, is a little island. It's an isolated network that your instance can't connect, that other people can't connect to. Your, your instance is on it, but it's not a routable network. Um, so we're going to add an external network. And this is something, as Ken was just saying, is, is done by the administrator. So I'm going to sign out of my um, non-privileged user and back into the administrator. And we're going to manage networks. So you can see that as the administrator, you can see my non-privileged internal network, um, but we have to create that external access. So I'm going to create this network. I'm going to call it external. 
This is kind of a general purpose network, so I like to put it in the service project. And the service project is one that all the components in OpenStack are members of. Um, and it's not, any, it's not a project that any end user has access to. And the way this external network works, um, putting it in this project makes it so that end users can't connect directly to it. They have to go through a router. And we're going to create that in just a minute. So trust me for a sec why it goes in the service tenant. <laughs> Um, by default, we, we go VXLAN is how RDO comes out of the box, so I'm selecting that. And then the network has to be marked as an external network, so that bottom checkbox there is saying this is an external network not intended for VMs to connect directly to. It's, it's providing external access that needs to be routed in. So we create this network, and you'll see right away that the internal network I created has a subnet on it already, but the external doesn't. Um, so you would work with your networking administrators to get the information about the subnet. So I'm going to create this subnet and these numbers that I'm, the, the subnet that I'm putting in here is specific to kind of a vanilla installation of RDO manager. So this isn't numbers that you would have to conjure out of nowhere. They're numbers that would be provided by a network administrator that is configuring the underlay network, the, the physical network that um, your machine is running on. The thing that's really important about an external network is to disable DHCP. So I've unchecked that DH, uh, enable DHCP. Um, and then what you'll notice is that in the network allocation, I put the whole slash 24 block, like the, the whole block of IPs in there that the instances that is available for that the, that the IPs that you want to associate with the instances would be a part of. So an allocation pool is a subset. So if, if I only have, say, 100 IPs that I can give to my instances to be able to get external access into them, they're part of a larger network, and you have to specify that whole network. But then you tell in that larger network that they're a part of, these are the ones in specific that I'm allowed to use. So in my allocation pool here, I'm going to put a collection of IPs that, again, would be provided by the network administrator that they would say, you know, you're a part of this larger network, but use only this subset of IPs. And what these are is a collection of static IPs that will be assigned to OpenStack instances. So now we have the external network, and we have an internal network. And let's see what that looks like to an end user. I'm going to log back in as the user I created. And there's this kind of cool tool, the network topology, that you can visualize what networks you have. So you can see here in blue, I've got my, my first instance here. So this is a representation of my instance. And I've got my internal network. So this is the first network that I created to attach my instance. And you can see the line where I've attached that instance to the internal network. And then you can see the external network that I just created as the administrator that specifies what block of IPs a network administrator has given to us to allocate to our instances. But there's no line between the external and the internal networks. So we have to connect those with a virtual router. So here you'll see there's a, a tab for routers. I don't have any created, so I'm going to create a router. And routers are specific to your project, so I'm naming it the same as my project. And then there's two connections that we have to make from, to that router. So if we look back at the, the topology, you'll see now that there's external network, there's a router that's just kind of not being used at all, and we're still connected instance to internal network. So on that router, we, we make two connections. One's to the external network, and that's called a gateway connection. And one's to the internal network, and that's called an interface connection. So on my router, I can go over and say, set gateway. I'm going to select my external network. And that then creates the connection between the router and the external network. And then on the router, there's an interfaces tab. So we'll select add interface. And I'm selecting the internal network. And that creates the connection from the router to the internal network. So now if we go back to our topology, you'll see that the lines connect between all of the pieces. So we have a first instance, which, which is the name of the instance, which has a 172 address, a private non-routable address. He's connected to the internal network and got his IP from the internal network. And then there's the router right above it here, which is connected to the internal network, creating a, a 
connection into the internal network out to the external network. And so what we're going to do next is take one of those external IPs and map it to the internal IP. So you have an internal IP it first came up on, an external IP that you can connect to, and then we map the two together so that the connection can go in. And the, what that's called is a floating IP. So we're going to go back to instances. I'm going to select a um, associate floating IP. And there's, there's two steps here. One is allocating a floating IP, so you first have to request one. I need a floating IP that I can use, so that's the allocation. And you'll con uh, if you can read this here, it says no floating IP address is allocated. So I go into my allocation box, say I want to select from my external network a floating IP, I allocate one. Now he says, oh, you have this particular IP address, and the port to be associated is the port on my first instance. So this is the mapping, taking the external IP I just requested and allocated to my project and mapping it into that internal IP. So we do associate, and then in first instance, you'll see now there's two IPs associated to that, the 172 address, which is the internal IP that's on it, and a 192 address, which is the quote-unquote external in our demo here. So at this point, there's an external connection, and you would think that you could take this IP and then um, connect it to I don't know what happened to my um, terminal. Let me open another one. Oh, it's over here. Here's my terminal. So here, if I try and ping my address, we actually can't yet. And what that leads back to is our security group. So by default, your security group is nothing can get through. And so remember when we launched the instance, we, we, attached, we had to specify a security group that this particular instance would be in. It went in default, and a new security group has rules that say nothing gets in and nothing gets out. Or I think it's nothing gets in, but things can get out is what happens. So if we go back to this... Go back to the web interface, we can look at access and security and look at security groups. So here's our default security group right here where we can manage the rules in it. So what I'm going to do is in this security group, I'm going to say add a rule and select all ICMP. So let ping get in. And this is an instant change. So when I say add this, we can go back there and you see that it starts to ping the instance right away. I can do the same thing for... SSH and say allow all SSH traffic into this tenant and now I should be able to SSH as a Cirrus user to this IP address. Is that text big enough? Can you see that? There we go. Cirrus has a, a standard password Cubs win smiley face. So um, in general, you don't get the password to the instances that are downloaded off the web, but since this one is testing and super insecure, um, we can all celebrate with the Cubs. I, I'm not sure what that Cubs win means. But, um, so there we are. We're, we're in an instance now that we've launched. We've created this external access. The external access is, is a lot. It's complicated, there's a lot of moving parts, and that's what everybody says that starts with OpenStack. I went through it, you know, people that we've done this presentation with say the same thing. It's, it's a lot of pieces, and it's a complicated thing to start, and if you're not a networking person, I've been telling people networking is hard, and I've really struggled to learn it, specifically because I started working on OpenStack. So if it didn't all connect the first time, um, you know, go back and, and read through this again, read some docs online, um, you know, I, I have a whole chapter dedicated to this in my book specifically because it's a complicated topic and it's not something that as developers or operators people just kind of know by default. Um, so if that went by too quick or it, it didn't connect right away, um, I'm happy to answer questions. Let's try and get through at least the, the rest of these things and then we'll get to questions. And, um, yeah. So uh, one thing I would say, it, it, um, 
I think the concept of having, you want to go back to the topology for a second? Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so one way that, um, that may help you kind of grasp what's going on, think about each tenant, um, okay, how about this way? Think about each tenant as a town, right? And the town has private um, roadways, which is great for getting from house to house within the town, but it can't get to any, but it can't get to another town because right, the private roadways are only internal within that town. So that's basically your internal tenants of the, those internal networks are essentially those private row rates. Um, for, so what, what in the history of you know, any country, for, in order to um, make it possible for you to go from one town to the other town, you built the highway, right? And that highway basically spans across multiple towns and then you connect the roadways, the private roadways, um, through an ingress point, through a rampway into that highway, and that's how you can go from place to place. So that's what the, that's so, so that's a, the external network is is essentially a highway that you've built that goes across all the towns that you have, and then the router is basically that on ramp, right, from your private roadway in, that, in a, any given town into that highway. Does that make sense, analogy wise? So that's um, th that's one way to help think about it. How's everybody doing? Not if you're alive. Anybody need a snack? <laughs> I'd love one too. Go get me one. Just kidding. Um, so, is there any way to convert the old style of seeing this, uh, the view of the topology? You mean the, oh, you mean the line way? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I miss it too. <laughs> I liked the line topology. This is, it's fancy, but it's more complicated to understand, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as far as I know, there's not. I think it's in Liberty, they switched over to this style, and I think we're all just going to take it, I guess. <laughs> okay, so we've got an instance up. Um, one of the next things that you probably want to do with this instance that has a little bit of virtual space is attach it to some kind of storage that is persistent, right? Because OpenStack in general is intended or is, is presented as ephemeral storage or an elastic cloud, right? That instances are intended to be able to disappear and reappear. And so if you have something you want to save, you need to save it somewhere other than on the instance because it could be terminated and disappear in the blink of an eye. Um, of course, there's, as Ken mentioned, a lot of controversy around Elastic Cloud versus enterprise virtualization and the paradigms between the two and whether instances should be long-lived or be quick to die. And um, You can argue that with somebody else, I guess, <laughs> or uh, afterwards. So Cinder is block storage, right? We can create these, these virtual persistent block storage devices on demand. They get stored in a larger pool of storage and attach them to the instances so that if instances need to change or the storage needs to be persisted over a longer term uh, time frame, then it gets stored on these Cinder volumes. Um, you, can, you have the ability to do snapshots, so if, if you need to do some kind of snapshotting with it, you're able to do that. It also has a, a pluggable architecture for its backing store as well. So by default out of the box, it's going to do LVM storage and create LVs for each of the volumes that you create. But if you wanted to attach to um, some kind of storage appliance, let's say, and, and attach that into OpenStack, there's lots of vendors that have drivers that you can use uh, their particular flavor of uh, appliance to do that. Or I, I think NFS is supported as well. So if you had like an NFS server, uh, there, there's lots of different backing stores that can be. Yeah, so let me one thing, mention one thing. Um, a lot of people get confused about this. So um, if, particularly if you work with um, enterprise storage arrays, um, you probably think of uh, a block storage device as a, a volume on a SAN that multiple uh, instance servers can access. That's not what Cinder is. <laughs> The, be the best way to think about Cinder is that is a, essentially a USB drive that you, uh, that you plug into an instant, a VM, or you unplug. And the key there is, um, while it is persistent, right, if you pull the USB drive out of a machine, the data still sits there, but that USB drive can't be shared between two machines, mm -hmm. right? So Cinder cannot be shared between two different instances. Uh, what it can do is you can plug into one, save stuff, and then if you, 
uh, either intentionally or unintentionally destroy that VM, you can essentially take that uh, cinder volume and plug it into another instance, like a US, you can do a USB drive. Okay, makes sense? Um, which is one of the reasons you, uh, and I bring that up because sometimes people go, well, now I have block storage, which is like share storage, therefore I should be able to do like vMotion <laughs> of, of uh, instances. But that's not, you can't do that because Cinder is not a shared, shareable storage volume. Uh, there is, as I mentioned, a debate going on, so there is some people who want to push to make Cinder a more a traditional SAN type volume. So. Mm -hmm. But that's not there yet. And there's another project in the OpenStack ecosystem that does shared storage. So while Cinder doesn't do it, there is capability within OpenStack at large for shared storage on demand um, in a project called Manila. So working. Mm -hmm. No, there's some shared storage on the back end within Nova, which is where those, uh, it, it has to do where the, the instance dr uh, disks get stored when you configure Nova. And if you configure shared storage across Nova, then you can do those live migrations, but it's, it's separate from Cinder. Yeah, it's, it's a little confusing. So there's two types of live migration, right, in, in the OpenStack with KVM. One is where the, the, the data stays on the storage and you're just kind of um, moving it to, to another VM or you can actually move it where you have to actually move all the data also has to get copied over. Um, so if you use Cinder, you're essentially copying the data over. If you, if you want to do um, live migration where you don't have to move the data, you have to use something like NFS or some kind of shared file system. So that will be Manila, if I can uh, potentially, okay. right? Now the issue obviously with using NFS is uh, for certain types of workloads, um, it may not give you the, that latency may be too high, or it may not give you the, ban um, the speed that you need, IO requ requirements that you need, so it depends. So again, that's why the, all these debates are and new blueprints are going in all the time. Seth? Seth? Seth, Seth can be used as a um, backing store. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But, but if you use Ceph as Cinder, it inherits all the limitations of Cinder. Mm -hmm. And I use limitation in quotes because, again, if you're, the, if you're on the cloud native side of things, you would say, well, actually, it's a good thing. Or that it shouldn't, you shouldn't need to have shared storage in a cloud. That's actually anti-cloud. So... All right, so creating a volume, creating a cinder volume here. Um, I'll call it first vol. You guys see how I'm being very creative with the names here. Uh, and so it's, it's got a size of one gig, and it goes out and creates an LV in the LVM storage on the control node for this particular one, for this particular configuration. And then what we can do is manage attachments. So if we select an instance to attach it to, the first instance which we created, it will take this volume that we've created and attach it to that instance so the instance has access to it. So if we go back out to our, our Cirrus instance and look at dev vd. So if, if you see there, there's, there's two volumes. Um, there's, there's two block devices there. There's VDA, which is the device that Cirrus booted off of, and then there's VDB, and that's the sender volume that's been attached. So at that point, you could treat it as a normal block device. You can go in and put a partition table on it. You can put a file system on it. You can mount it. And then in sender, if you needed to detach it, we can go back into manage attachments and say, hey, let's detach this volume. And if we go back and look at the instance, um, it will uh, 
So there now only VDA exists. So we, we attached it, it was VDB, and then I detached it, and now VDB is disappeared. This is really exciting, right? Um, we, should we go through and create a file system on it too? You guys want to see that? Yeah, sure. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm. No, it's just presenting it. So, if, yeah, if, you, uh, if you're familiar with libvert, it's just like creating an, another virtual disk and presenting it to that instance. It'll show up as a block device, but what you then do with it, you, you know, it's like if you, bought, if you have a computer and you stick a new hard drive in it, it's not going to get automatically mounted. You have to go in and put a partition table on it, a file system, and put it in FS tab or something like that. So it's, I mean, it's... it's an extra hard drive that's being attached, essentially. Yeah, so there's a lot, there's a, a lot of different levels of abstraction going on in Cinder. So the storage arrays is creating a virtual volume, essentially. That's the hypervised, the, the KVM, the Linux node, then the Linux node is actually mounting that virtual volume. And then you have to create another virtual volume on top of that, or file on top of that, that the VM can mount. So it's just different levels of abstraction. That's, um, that's why it's not automatically mounted. By default, it's using iSCSI to present the volume from the control node to the instance. And so the hypervisor then takes that iSCSI target and attaches it to the instance right. and presents it as a block device by way of iSCSI. Right. So from the, from the uh, instance or the VM point of view, it's a local disk. Mm -hmm. right. But then if you used a different backing store, it may not necessarily work like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it, it so every hypervisor handles things a little differently. So, but it's still an iSCSI target if you're using this, this particular. So it, whether you're using VM as a backing or KVM, well, yeah. iSCSI is going to be prevented. Vsphere right? does something entirely different. So. Oh, yeah. So Vsphere does. Don't listen to me about v VMware. V VMware <laughs> uses a VMDK. So that VMDK is actually an le extra level of abstraction. So behind that VMDK, it could be iSCSI, it could be NFS, it could be. Z Fiber channel. Yeah, so it's a completely different, that's a completely different model. <laughs> All right, so our last component we're going to look at here is Swift, and Swift is object storage. So we just looked at block storage, which is, you know, the equivalent of presenting a new hard drive or a USB stick or something to a machine like that, and you have to interact with it as a block device, where Swift is uh, object storage. It's an, it's an API where you have a very plain object, it's, it's file content, and it has a name, and so you push it out to your object store and you pull it back, and so the, we can connect to it through the dashboard and interact with an object store. We can connect to an object store from an instance, but wherever you're connecting to, whatever you're connecting to this object store from, it's still just file content. It doesn't keep any extra metadata or anything about it. So Swift was the original object store in OpenStack, um, and it's, it itself is a distributed um, software-defined storage solution. So similar to like, um, you can use Ceph as a backing store instead of the Swift object store as a backing store. You could use GlusterFS. There's, there's multiple different backing stores that you can use for Swift. So in general, Swift we look at as the API to a backing store that's used, and you can use the Swift object store, which is part of the Swift project, but you also have different options as well. Um, so software-defined network, or software-defined storage is, is a distributed software-based solution for uh, storage, and that's exactly what Swift is trying to do, is take these objects and distribute them horizontally across the software-defined storage system. Um, there's redundancy and failure proofing with uh, not just Swift Object Store, but other backing stores you can use, as well as data replication for them. Um, here I'm just going to show you the interface here. So in Object Store, we could select containers, create container. This would be my first container. 
You guys see the theme? Come on, that was funny. Next you're going to tell me I'm funny looking, right? Uh, so we have a container, uh, first container here, and in that container then we could upload an object. So I'm going to choose a file and uh, how about I upload my Cirrus image just for fun. And so that particular, whatever file got uploaded could have been anything. I, I used that image. It could have been a SSH pub key or a text file or whatever it is. The point of it is it's, it's just file content. It's just bits that get put up there and then have an arbitrary name. So the fact that it's 0034 whatever is, is kind of a moot point. We could have called it 123 or this is my first file if we wanted to be really consistent. Um, and then what you could do on, on an instance is install the Swift client and then connect to Swift and say, give me, you know, list out my objects that are in the object store and pull this file down or add one back in. So it's, it's very simple file movement um, without the overhead of block storage, right? So if, if block storage got disconnected, there's the possibility for corruption where with file object storage, um, you're looking more at did the complete set of file get put into the API or not, did the connection get severed. Uh, and the, the block storage level where it's being written on disk is handled by the object store and not by your operation that you're writing. Um, Do you have a good example yeah, of that? Yeah, so, like, so think of it as it's, it's, it's ideal for um, when you have a lot of small files um, that you need to that you need to always be there, and you need a lot of concurrent access. So uh, the, the classic example is, think iTunes. So iTunes use, doesn't use Swift, but they use, it does use an object storage. So iTunes is what? A lot of small MP3 files, right, that Apple can't afford to have suddenly not be available, right? And millions of people could be accessing that same MP3 or download at the same time. So that's kind of the use case. It's millions, typically mil thousands to millions of small uh, files, image files, music files, whatever it may be, that needs to be always available uh, and needs to be accessed by maybe hundreds of thousands of users at the same time. So to be honest, I think there are most OpenStack implementations today do not have Swift. Hmm. Um, that may change over time, but obviously, the, just is just the case that most applications, you think about most, there aren't that many applications in the world that require, that have so specific requirements, right? You know, your Word document, your home, your home drives uh, for your Word documents are, aren't going to meet that, right? <laughs> that level of protection or, or concurrency, so. Does that help? Is that helpful? Okay, let's finish up here. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, there is a command line, and so I talked about the unified command line project that's been happening. If you go down to the command line in OpenStack, you can ask for help, and you can ask for help on specific commands, and it's all in this OpenStack CLI. We don't have really enough time to get into that, um, but it's all out there, and so all the stuff that we've kind of done point and click and click and click and click can all be automated through CLI commands, and there's even libraries where you can hit OpenStack directly and not even have to use um, these clients here. Um, I talked about InStack having the file that had the password in it, so um, if you were going to use the CLI, you'd use a, a Keystone RC file, and this is an example of one that um, you can see the username and the tenant and the password. The auth URL is connecting to Keystone, um, and then when you source that file, the bottom line shows, okay, I've got all these environment variables up in there in my environment, and when I connect to OpenStack, it's going to use that information. Um, so. Components we've looked at here, we, we've done all this through Horizon Dashboard. We looked at Keystone Identity Management. We looked at Glance Image Management. We looked at um, OpenStack Networking, creating a network for our instance to be on. We looked at uh, then using Nova to launch an instance, using the image and the network that was created. And then we attached block storage to it and looked at how we could put data into object storage through Cinder for block storage and Swift for object storage. Um, so this is 
a few of the components that are in OpenStack, and there is a bunch. Um, this is the official list from the Liberty release documents of the components that are part of um, OpenStack. And I'm not going to go through all these now, uh, but you know you can see there's a lot of them. And if you have questions about any of these, what they do or how they fit into OpenStack, um, happy to chat about it later. Yeah, and you know, I'll go back for one second. Oh, sorry. And, and one of the things I want you to know here, it's a couple, couple of things to take note. One is if you kind of went through them, you'll notice that there is, uh, for almost all of them, there's an analogy, analogous uh, technology within Amazon Web Services. So again, it gets back to the idea of uh, really OpenStack is trying to be an open source alternative to AWS. Then keep in mind, obviously, we've, we've, Dan's been trying to show you kind of, in, kind of how things work internally and setting up, but the way OpenStack really designs all these things, once they are being set up by the admin, there should, there is, should be very little configuration work that has to be done by the end user. Right? Should, again, like AWS, it should be a service that a, that a end user just selects and basically attaches to. Do you have anything to say about that? It's a spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. Hopefully, you enjoyed the snacks and the open stack. Yeah. Um, if you have questions, yep, here, so. uh, happy to answer them. Um, I, th I guess we have a few minutes if you wanted to use the mic, but you're also welcome just to come up and ask questions. So um, thanks for your time today. You know, you've already had your quota of questions. Sorry. Somebody else asked a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. If you go to rdoproject.org, um, there's a big icon that says RDO Manager there, and it has, there's a little more complicated steps than just PackStack, because PackStack is more of a proof of concept, really quick installation, but RDO Manager is much more full featured, has capabilities to do, you know, HA deployments and, and plug Ceph in for you. Um, so there's a few more steps to get it done, but it's all documented out there, and um, the script that I use to set up my demo literally just walks through the steps on that uh, wiki page there. Are you with your uh, ask Pact Publishing if they will <laughs> do it. Because <laughs> I, I would like to have a chapter in there about RDO Manager. Yeah. That book is really good. Thanks. He says the book is good. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, I actually have a copy of it. So if any of you are interested in looking through it, um, it's, it's, um, you're, you're welcome to thumb through it and see if you if you like what's in it so yeah it's a quick read yeah. sure like the the glance image it it's a disk image so are you familiar with say libvert or parallels or something like that that when you launch a vm there's a virtual disk underneath that that's backing that image that it boots off of and that the operating system is installed in and when you write something to disk in that image or in that vm it's writing to that virtual disk image that's what glance is holding uh, just disk images that you can launch vms off of the difference is that in say libvert or some hypervisor it gives you this VM and you usually give it an installation method. So the first thing you do is you bring it up and you install something on that VM and then when you power it off and power it back on, you have something already installed on it. In OpenStack, instead of you being given this VM and then you having to do the installation, we pre-bake the images so that they're already there, they're already installed. So when you launch it, there's a few things that get generated on boot like SSH keys and that make sure that the Macs don't conflict and, and a few specific things, but those images that are in Glance are generic so that when the VM launches, it can use the same image over and over for each of the images, and your boot time is like this because you don't have to do the, ins the OS installation. It was done a ahead of time. So the images that are registered in Glance are, are just virtual disk images like you would use in any virtualization um, system. They're just pre-installed with the OS for you. In that respect, it is a template. The, the image that you're booting from has been made generic enough that 
if you launch it multiple times, it doesn't conflict with the other ones. There's, there's VM-specific information that gets generated on boot so that you can take this glance image, which is essentially a template of the disk image and make copies of it and launch instances. And then those instances, when they boot, will do what they need to make that the, their copy of the glance image. Um, yeah, it does. Correct. Yeah, it'll, it'll have a different UID and all that, so mm -hmm. it, won't, it won't conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It'll be on the hypervisor by default. So it'll glance has a backing store, and when you upload your image into Glance, it writes it there. And then when the hypervisor launches a VM, it goes to Glance and says, hey, give me a copy of this disk image, and it puts it in its storage. Uh, and there's actually caching in between that as well. So it caches it, and then it makes a copy of it, and then it launches the instance off of the copy that it made. And then if that instance goes away, it throws away that disk image, but the Glance image that was originally uploaded and the cached copy on the hypervisor still exists. So then on the same hypervisor, if you launch subsequent instances, it uses that cached copy. But say on a different hypervisor, you launch and it hasn't cached a copy. It'll go back into Glance, pull it, cache it, copy it, launch it. So it's, it's copying this disk image, these kind of, like you're saying, kind of templatized disk images, if you will, uh, within the cloud system. It doesn't get quite that granular, um, but it, it does allow you to split some of that stuff out. And I, I believe that granularity is something that has been asked for and will probably be allowed in future versions of it. Oh, no, not at all. Yeah, you can, and it'll support bare metal as well. So if you've got bare metal machines and you want, you know, three controllers and ten compute nodes and a SUF cluster, it'll do that. It can do that. Yeah, the configuration I used here was very simplistic for demonstration purposes. <laughs> so it would run on my laptop. <laughs> Got just finished it. <laughs> Installation. Oh, did it? Yeah, I started, like, when the beginning, the install. For Packstack? For RDO Manager? Yeah. Oh, great. No, no, no. You want me to start over? Well, hopefully you can, hopefully the video will come off. If, okay. uh, I don't, I assume they recorded it. I don't know. It was recorded? <laughs> we'll just have to yeah. check the link next time. If not, you can have my card and I'll okay. answer your questions if you have. <laughs> sure. Uh, it's an open stack project. So there's a uh, there's a couple of companies. There's, uh, Red Hat is from the blog. Mm -hmm. HP sure. blogs, and Rackspace, sort of like so, something similar. Okay. So in our testnet, we're using a Mirage distribution. Red Hat, I don't think that's yeah, for Red Hat. No, they do something completely different. They use different. their own uh, project. What's the advantage of having a triple O in the It's faster because you pre-build everything, and then, so, you know how, so we, we loaded a Glance image into Glance, yeah. and that image got copied out to the VM, and the VM launched, right? It's very similar the way that Triple O works, in that the, the in-stack machine, that installation machine, is an all-in-one open-stack installation, and you load Glance images into there, okay. and then what it does is it's able to discover these bare metal machines in a way that it can then write the glance image out to the machine. So instead of having to install the operating system and then install the OpenStack packages and then run the configuration, you have the OS and all the OpenStack packages and a glance image. That glance image gets written directly, like block written to the disk of the bare metal machine. It boots and then it does the configuration after there. So there, there, there's an active, <laughs> there's, there's not a consensus 
Some people think actually triple is not a good idea. Oh, yeah. So it's tanks. Yeah. Why is it not a good idea? The same reason people think that elastic cloud versus virtual compute, you know, uh, enterprise well, virtualization. Fair, it's, so, um, there, there's well, multiple way, different. No, no one's ever accused OpenStack of being too easy. Okay. <laughs> right. So, so, the, so some people are saying. But some people, well, some, the argument, I'm not, and I'm not saying it's a good argument, but it's okay. the argument. OpenStack is hard. Yes. To install okay. as it is. So, why would I want to use something? hard to install in order to install something that's hard to install. Well, I thought triple is supposed to simplify the installer. Right, but some people have argument is well, OpenStack is really hard. Okay. So if it seems logically, it doesn't seem to make logical sense to take, to take the very thing that you said is too hard to install and use it to make it simple to install. Does that make sense? That's all they're saying. But with, with everything, there's people on both sides yes. of the fence. Yes. So People are gonna hate and people are gonna That's love right. it and it's you know it's, it's what works for you is what you gotta yeah, do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes I call the telco environment and we are considering whether should we uh, use open stack to support NFD. Yes. For what I see it's like that <laughs> open stack is like evolving, it's still maturing and you know like the question keep coming out is that whether is it mature enough to support NFD. I think the bigger question there is whether or not the SDN controllers are mature enough to support uh, NFB because OpenStack has become mature to the point that it's running in production all over the place. It, it does very well at running instances. But typically enterprise environment, but not yet quite in the production environment with Telco. Well, so I think we're going to be wrong. Like you said, it's a networking technology that's underneath the open stack. That's not. Okay. And two, what do you mean by mission critical applications? Well, uh, yeah, it's, uh, telcos haven't deployed it because the networking support for NFB isn't there, is, is my view of why telcos haven't adopted it. But the OPNFB project is basically a bunch of telcos that got together and yeah. said, let's create an NFB platform. And so at this point, we're working with the control the controller projects to try and help get the NFB capabilities, you know, simple like chaining, right? Server yeah. function chaining is not something that's anywhere close to being in OpenStack. And so being able to have that type of functionality for OpenStack is plugging in a more complicated networking system like an SDN controller than what Neutron can do. And that's like that's a lot of the work that we're doing now is working with those projects to try and add NFB networking capabilities so that when you launch an instance, when you launch a VNF, that it has the underlying networking plumbing to you know, pass the NSH protocol properly to, to get your service chaining in or, or you know, whatever networking, whatever it is that you need to do in the telco space. And I, I think that's the separation between OpenStack and telco. Not that OpenStack can't run VNFs. OpenStack can run a VNF all day long, but is the network plumbing underneath going to support the networking functions that need to happen for telcos to operate properly? And that's what's immature. That's where OPNFB is, is trying to <coughs> evolve in the market to support telcos. But uh, is there any difference between OpenStack service function chaining versus the service function chaining for FT? Say that one more time. Okay, is there any difference between OpenStack service function chaining uh -huh. versus SC, ETSI? Uh, oh, SC. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, is, is there any difference or they are the same thing? Well, so OpenStack doesn't have service function chaining. And okay. that's what OPNFB is trying to provide is that networking capability. Okay. OPNFB is working with Etsy to do their, to follow their standards so that when OPNFB has something that they deliver that it follows the SE standards. So what get, what comes out of OPNFB and what OPNFB is attempting to accomplish with the SDN controllers is by SE guidelines. Because I hear some of the presenters mentioning about service function chaining, but they say that it's more like a port function chaining or something like that. Um, port function yeah, chaining? Yeah, yeah. In the virtual world it is. So <laughs> Neutron, when it attaches an instance into one of those virtual networks that we created, there's um, a, another layer of abstraction there that's a neutron port, right? And so the, the port
support is the connection between the instance and the network. And so in virtual service function chaining, you're taking these ports that Neutron knows about and then creating chaining rules around them so that um, when the, the packets are passed, they go through the specifications of your chain. And that happens through the port because all the networking traffic, all the packets that go in between, at this point, the VNFs are going to pass through these neutron ports. Yes, I think the NFE standard is still so new. I would, I would guess that unless you have a lot of engineering capabilities developed in house, you may need to wait a little bit. But that's the thing, we are not at Amazon and we are not at Google. We can still have a group of developers behind us to help us. Well, but this is the thing. So the open NFE system. Hopefully, addressing mm -hmm. that if you open that, because then you have yeah. a source of yeah. 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 behind it. Yeah. But yeah. they're still working yeah. on that. Because yeah. that yeah. OpenStack wasn't yeah. designed yeah. originally yeah. to do NFT. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, that's that pulled everything essentially. Yeah. 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 Not only is it so that's like not that, yeah. 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 the OP and NFT is more like you support ATT domain to the old initiative. Because there's a lady. I really much the CTO of AT&T and the chairing of AT&T. I'm not so sure. I was not bothering you with this. I was not bothering you with this. Give updates to all the teams. I don't know. No, it's good. Yeah, having a little insight. Thank you so much. I'll ask you for some uh, recommendations when I do a revised edition. Feel free. Feel free. Hi, I'm Kevin. Nice to meet you. I'm listening to you. And uh, I did overlook, uh, I did the triple O PHP. I understand the triple O challenges. Yeah, it's a, it is a challenge. <laughs> it's a nightmare. <laughs> there you go. It's a different so, mindset. It's not traditional installation and, and system administration operation as, as you know, the data center knows it. So to come in and say, oh, we're going to do image-based installation now, is, it's a big shift for the general ops population. And it has its advantages, it has its disadvantages, just the same that the traditional installation has advantages and disadvantages. And so, you know, it's, it's again, another one of the things what works right for you is what you need to do, and what doesn't work right for you is either you're, you know, you either use it or well, jump in. Uh, I recommend that um, or to move away from triple O, you guys have another uh, product or tool is called a helium life cycle manager or something like that. Similar like that, we 